time. Yeah. 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 I haven't had it either. As we get started tonight, I want you to uh, know I appreciate you being here and I appreciate our council being here, and, uh, zoning board, and all the folks who are interested in being here. Coming to these meetings, it's been a, a long process. It's finally winding down, and uh, I just want to say thank you to NACOG for all that they've done. They've put hundreds of hours in this, and I appreciate that as we get it closer to being done. Uh, it'll be something I think that we can live with. But uh, I'm going to pass this around. We really need to know who's here, so boy, if you had to sign it, sign it, pass it on down. And then, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, and after that, uh, if you want to have questions and answers, we'll tackle that at that time. And Nathan, as always, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you, let you go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, man. Once again, I thank everyone for being here this evening. And uh, this is the third and final, to this point, public workshop that we have planned. Uh, after tonight, hopefully we'll address at least the broad strokes of what the zoning ordinance recommendations are going to be. And then we'll turn it over to the Planning Commission to refine the uh, map and the ordinance with their recommendations. We'll package that up and we'll forward it on to the council as a formal recommendation. We will have yet another public hearing at that time so that we can discuss any changes that have been made. Um, probably this is the third of three public workshops that we were planning. Uh, this one is more or less to just present the maps and the ordinance text. If there are any questions about those and to just go ahead and review uh, what it is that we've done over the past six weeks and to talk a little bit about the changes that have been incorporated into the text of the ordinance and onto the map that you see up there. First couple of workshops, we spent a good deal of time, well, I guess I should back up. I, in case there's anyone who has not been introduced to me yet, uh, most of y'all have stuck with it. I'm sure we know who I am by now. My name is Nathan Willingham. I'm with Northwest Alabama Council of Local Governments, and I'm the Director of Planning and Transportation there. Our agency serves five counties and 32 municipalities included. We're privileged to also work with the City of Hamilton in our service area. Uh, at the first workshop, we talked about the origins of zoning. We talked about the need for cities to regulate growth and development as urbanization picked up, as um, density patterns changed uh, as we moved from the grain to a more industrial and urban society. We talked about some of the bad conditions that prompted the adaptation of zoning for use in urban areas. Um, standard zoning, le zoning legislation was produced to sort of guide states in the adoption of their enabling legislations, which permit cities to, uh, to practice zoning as an extension of their police powers. We talked about the uses of zoning to guide, the purposes of zoning to guide the use of property and the design of parcels of land. Basically, zoning is divided into two types of activities that it can regulate. One is the activity that takes place on the property, which is a use regulation. And then the other is the design of the property, how a structure relates to other structures inside of a certain neighborhood. We talked a good deal at the last, at the last meeting about the concept of neighborhood design and, and its importance to the zoning process and its importance to stabilizing community growth patterns and community development. We also talked about some of the common concerns that people have when we discuss zoning ordinances, chief among them being their right to use the property and, of course, the impacts that other uses have on their properties as well. We talked about the need to have a zoning ordinance that is tailored to meet the needs of the city of Hamilton and that is not something that is exclusionary or that creates a cookie cutter development pattern. Some of the specific issues that we discussed with respect to the city of Hamilton were a number of provisions in the ordinance that were cumbersome and or unused uh, dealing with repetitive floodplain issues Airport zoning that never found its way onto the map, repetitive professional districts, um, those sorts of things. Specific things that we wanted to address as part of the revision of the zoning ordinance text dealt with the lack of an agricultural zoning district in Hamilton. There's a large area that's, that's mostly open space, forested, or agrarian, agricultural in nature that surrounds the core of development along the corridors and in the, in the neighborhoods in the heart of downtown Hamilton. And several times over the past four or five years, we've been asked about what uses were permitted and agricultural uses were permitted in those areas. And there are one zoning district that was in place before, really didn't have any provisions to address those. It was a bit too restrictive for a more rural residential area like you find in much of Hamilton. Naturally, we've had many conversations about the appropriate location of manufactured housing and about what the proper rules are for non-conforming uses. 
both in general as well as specifically dealing with manufactured homes. So what we've done as part of this process is we tried to keep the dialogue open every couple of weeks to talk about what the concerns were, what the issues were with the city of Hamilton. And then we've gone parcel by parcel and attempted to identify exactly what is, is taking place, what use is taking place on those properties, existing uses throughout the city. And then to sort of screen those for conflicts where they exist with the, with the current zoning ordinance. Um, most of those conflicts, again, dealt with agricultural uses or dealt with manufactured housing. And we put together a set of recommendations, we discussed these at our last meeting, that identify the areas with the greatest level of conflicts, which were in the existing R1 districts by and large, and attempt to treat those at an appropriate scale. And when we're talking about scale, we've been talking a good bit about neighborhood scale, which is a location that has similar land uses. And all of the uses within that area are, are seemingly compatible with one another. So the recommendations that we put together for the council, or for the planning commission to, to review before sending to the council, address the zoning districts on the one hand and the non-conforming status of property on the other. The major recommendations that we made within the zoning districts were to revise the R1 district, which was previously just for single-family residences on individual lots. Our recommendation has been to broaden that district into an R1 agricultural and rural district, which would permit agricultural uses, single-family residences on individual lots, as well as manufactured housing. In, in recommending the placement of that on this map, we referred back to our existing land use, and we tried to identify the areas that warranted single-family protections because they were primarily single-family in character. Those neighborhoods were already mostly single-family. There's a couple areas within these proposed districts that are single-family zoned for single-family uses that we do recognize there are existing non-conforming manufactured houses in those areas. And so I'll speak to a little bit later what we're doing to address those. So the first recommendation as far as zoning districts was to broaden the R1 to allow for agricultural as well as manufactured housing. And then, of course, to locate that district on the map. The second recommendation was to create an R2 district that provided single-family protections for those neighborhoods that were already predominantly single-family in nature. And when you, so when you look on the map, the areas in the yellow that's designated as R2 are areas that the existing land use show, by and large, are already single-family homes on individual lots. They're already residential neighborhoods. The R3 district we've recommended to remain unchanged. It, it allows for duplexes and apartments as well as single-family homes. We've tried to identify as many areas that are already in multiple family uses, either apartments yeah. or duplexes, that are already existing in that form and to designate those as R3. So in placing the R3 district, we wished, we wished to create or recommend that existing apartments and duplexes be granted conforming status. Then within the business and industrial districts, the major change there was the elimination of the neighborhood business and professional business districts. As part of our recommendation, we're saying that there are generally two characters of commercial development in Hamilton. If you drive around and you look at what constitutes a, a typical commercial development, you've got your downtown district, which is one type. It's a very distinctive development pattern. When you're there, you recognize that it is a, a traditional or a, a traditional business district. It's a traditional downtown pattern and design. And that's something that you want to, to lock in place going forward. And then generally outside of that, where areas are zoned for businesses or have developed as businesses, uh, that has a very highway or auto-oriented look to it. It's a general commercial business district outside of the downtown area. And then finally, the industrial districts, we've not recommended any changes for those. You still have an M1 light industrial and M2 heavy industrial. Uh, that reflect different impacts as far as spokestacks and heavy traffic and things of that nature. And then the final area of recommendations that we wanted to address in the draft dealt with non-conforming uses. Sometimes called grandfathered uses. Non-conforming use is an existing use of property that would not be permitted under a new set of regulations. So say there's no ordinance in place and I have a business in a district that winds up being zoned residential. I have a vested interest in that property and being able to continue the use of that business without it being shut down by the city or without losing my property right to use that parcel for that particular business that I've already invested in. 
That's not informed use, often called grandfathered use. In the ordinance that we have in place right now, if the use is abandoned for 12 months, that owner would be unable to reestablish there. In addition, if the structure was lost through a fire or some other reason, they would not be able to reestablish a non-conforming structure in that location. Uh, and that's caused problems in the past, particularly as it deals with manufactured homes, but also potentially with existing businesses that may or may not be conforming. So after the recommendations that we're putting forward to the Planning Commission, if they were adopted, if a use is abandoned for 12 months, it can't be reestablished. So somebody, somebody through the, the destruction of a use or through voluntarily pulling out, just leaves it for 12 months. They don't make a, a reasonable attempt to reestablish that non-conforming use within 12 months um, and provide some evidence that they're good faith continuing to try to, to try to get back what was there before. If a period of 12 months lapses, then it loses that non-conforming status and has to be built in conformity with the district that it's in. However, if a structure is lost, so, so the use restrictions for non-conformity are, are virtually the same. However, if a structure was lost under the existing ordinance, you couldn't build it back unless you also put in a, a conforming use. Uh, under the, the regulations that we're recommending to the city, to the Planning Commission now, you can reestablish that use if you reestablish it with, in, within 12 months and also make every attempt to meet your current building setbacks in that district. So it's a much less restrictive non-conforming status for property owners who might want to move out of structure and move another structure back in, or who might suffer a total loss of the structure and want to reestablish. So if you can meet the setbacks within a year, you can reestablish. And this also applies to manufactured homes. Uh, before, what had happened often was a home couldn't be moved out and moved back in, so the standard was one that a property owner didn't have a lot of incentive to invest in improving that property because if they moved it out, they'd lose the non-conforming status and they wouldn't be able to put it back in. So over time, there's not as much incentive to move one out and improve the property and move one back in. So in the new ordinance, the way that it's structured because of the non-conforming provisions for structures that we just talked about, if an owner wants to pull a manufactured home out, if they can meet the setbacks bringing it back in within 12 months, they will retain their non-conforming use status. Now that's, that's a big difference than the, the environment that we were in before because now there is an incentive to improve that property in a shorter time frame versus what happened in, in, the, in the past under the existing ordinance. There was no incentive to improve that property until it just fell apart. So the way your ordinance is written, as long as the home is meets certain age restrictions, you can move it back in. And, of course, we can't re regulate every aspect of the home, but that is generally an improvement, thought to be encouraging improvement of properties in these neighborhoods that have non-conforming manufactured homes. So we thought that that was an important step. Now, we also talked a great deal about what the zoning process is, about the roles of the Planning Commission, the City Council, the Building Inspector, the Zoning Compliance Officer, and so forth. I won't bore you with any of those technical details unless you have a specific question about that. But mainly our purpose here tonight is to, to be able to present the maps and discuss any concerns that you've got about the text of the ordinance. So more or less, we're just here to have an open discussion and an open house where you're welcome to, after we finished sort of our open Q&A here to come up afterward and talk with me about specifics of the map. I wanted to, what we talked about a little earlier, in general, can you tell me, this is the, the revised map uh, from one uh, dated 9-5, it was, the draft was on 8-30. Can you tell me some general areas where you've changed since the last draft on the 30th, because some people have already been looking at the map. And yeah, you know, there's been we, changes since then. We have made changes to, to the boundary which I'll address, I'm sure, will be questioned about, as well as a couple of properties we were asked to take a closer look at what the existing use was and what the proposed use was. But those were all either in the fringe areas or internal. There were a couple in this area. With respect to the boundary, the existing zoning map uses the 2000 census boundary for the city now. 
That's not the only boundary that's out there floating around as far as information about where the administrative boundary or the official boundary of the city is. That's not a condition that's unique to the city of Hamilton. The census has at least three different boundaries for the city, 1990, 2000, and 2010. The 2000 boundary is the one that was in place at the time that the original zoning map was adopted. So it's the one that we've got on the maps that are here this evening. In addition to three different census files that show the area, there is information that is recorded at the probate office, and there's also information that has been picked up by the Revenue Commission, and there is the minutes of the city council. All of those are potential sources of city limits boundaries. And we recognize that a map is a visual depiction based on the best available data that we've got. A map establishes an administrative boundary that is the best that we can do with the information that we've got. There will be refinements to this map going forward. However, since this is the boundary that's been in place for the last five years for the city, making these text changes and retaining this boundary, we recommend because we may not have the best boundary and it may never be a perfect city limits boundary. But if we made improvements to the rules that we're going to enforce within that boundary, then we would recommend proceeding with the improvements that are going to ease the zoning restrictions for the vast majority of territory within the city limits and continuing to enforce the boundary that has been enforced administratively for the past four or five years while we move forward with the research that's necessary between the probate office, the city council minutes, and the revenue commissioner's office to address specific questions about what parcels are in and which parcels are not. He can. If it is thought by the council at any point that a, that a parcel needs to be zoned to receive commercial development, or if there's an existing business there that we missed, we need to have it zoned commercial. Why then, and when it was set up now, I'm saying the property out at the Fax Crossing, there's a lot of people spending a lot of money out there right now and hoping that that'll be a commercial, big commercial property. Why was it zoned as R1? I have to see the property specifically. I, I, don't, I, can't, I can't point to it on the map, so I can't see it specifically. Okay. Now, my, my general response to that would be because there's not an existing commercial development on those parcels. If it was an oversight and we need to have that property prepared for, prepared to receive new commercial development, then we certainly need to take a look at that. We based our zoning recommendations at this stage on the existing use of the property, not on any planned future use. But if there's a planned future use that we need to address through the zoning, change, then we certainly want to make sure that it's, it's in our set of recommendations before we send it to the plan. It's the property down at the other uh, outlet on uh, what I call the Bridge outlet down there. Is it zoned down there uh, as commercial? <coughs> Where the uh, spec building is and oh. all of that? Oh, across from the yeah. spec building, yes. Those parcels that have existing commercial development. We've well, tried to catch all of them as zoned. It would make it more attractive to anybody that's looking at it if they thought it was already zoned for commercial out there, I would think. Sure, and, and that is that is is something that we need to try as much as possible to capture before the council votes on this. But even if it does get adopted, there is a, a process in place but for rezoning. But would something to get it changed up? Under the current ordinance, there is a fee. That's and we are, we are in conversation about a reasonable grace period to make sure that we're not charging people for, for mistakes that we may not have incorporated in this new draft. But the clarion call you need right now is for people that are planning Show up and to make changes and we not, you may not know about it for, to go ahead and let you know now. Yeah, absolutely. And and then we'll we'll, we'll note those and the planning commission can review them and, and review the map and tell us what those are. And, and of course, comments from the public are welcome about areas that you know specifically where you either own the parcel or you know that it's it's going to commercialize. I don't know everything about the planned future of all the parcels in Hamilton. So really, we just went back to the base land use that was out there. This is, this is going to be an off-ramp for I-22. As soon as it comes to the board, we're going to naturally look at it. Yeah, and, and so if, if there are, 
when we finish up here this evening, when we turn it over into a more of an open house, let me know and, and we'll mark it on the map and we'll make sure that it's changed before it comes to the planning commission when it does. So anything I have to say we can wait for later? Sure. About the I'll be sugar being community on uh, 49 and 133 in that neighborhood, or can we open that? I, I welcome either form. Okay. Rather a small group discussion. Ron Collins Road, and I live at 431, County Highway 49. I've uh, been at that location about 23 years. Uh, that's going to be up 278 there. It's going to be right there where uh, Shell Station just got voted in to a city limit. Back multiple years ago, uh, when they came through with the city limits out through there, they did not have the Shell Station which it was called the Texaco Station at that time. And Don's place was a store that was opening on the right-hand side at the BP station. That station was in the city limits at that given moment, okay? And I think this council here has just voted in in the last, well, since they've been in office, uh, the Shell Station in the city limits, which back many years ago, you can go back on records and check it, they, uh, Mr. Moore out of Winfield, or wherever he's from, he voted not to have his store in the city limits at that time. So the city limits went around his store and went the entire distance out 278 to Mr. Delmo Payne's residence. It also, back then, it had turned left and went up 49 on the left-hand side all the way up to James Logan's chicken house. We have a city limit sign there. Uh, by looking at the map, I'm in the county. I've been I've been voting as a city resident for the last 20 plus years. I've been paying taxes for the last 20 plus years for the city of Hamilton. Why has it changed? What we're doing now is we're looking for records that validate those annexations. We're looking for records in the minutes and in the probate judge's office that show us that those annexations occurred. Because there's a lot of tradition and a lot of history that we all know has occurred. Um, those parcels are, are probably shown on the property assessor's data because at some point there was a record that the city intended to annex it and that was recorded in the probate office. So what we're trying to do now is to incorporate those in and out with the best data that we've got into this boundary. As to why it's not shown on there, there are a number of explanations for it. Um, the, the easiest to, to explain is that in 1990, thereabout, the census got into the mapping program. And they started asking every year for cities to draw their maps. And cities were then, they were drawing their maps based on maps that were provided by the census that did not have an accurate scale on them. So a lot of areas are misproportionate, and a lot of areas aren't shown because it's based on a local update of that boundary every 10 years. And if you look at 1990, 2000, and 2010, there's a great deal of area on the 2010 boundary for this map. Much larger amount of, of territory on the 2010 boundary that is shown as in, that there's no record of it having been brought in, than there is that is showing in, for example, on the uh, property of the tax assessor's records. Because there are several folks here I know that have said, well, we've been incorporated on the tax rolls, but we're not incorporated, and in some cases voted, we're not incorporated on the boundary. Yeah, because when we got the, uh, the city water, when the city water came out through there, see, we had a city grant, <laughs> and they paid pretty much for all that that water works out through there. Uh, we all came to the city council then. It was uh, quite a few from the neighborhood, and we all thought the left-hand side was in the city limits as you go out through there. As you go out through there on the right-hand side is in the county. Uh, we have two garbage trucks that runs out there. We have local law enforcement that runs out through there to the left-hand side of 133 as they turn beside my house and go out through, you know, all the city, they run out through there. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, why now that we're in the county? I, saw, I mean, you know, that's pretty much it. I, I don't have no other 
I'll manager, say I'll what? say you're not in the zoning boundary. I don't I can't say whether you're in the county or not. This is the boundary that has been adopted for the zoning ordinance. I can't say whether you're in the county. And it will take some more specific research and, and try to find those ordinances um, that you that you brought up earlier that would have brought in that left side of the street, that would have brought in those property owners by an exception. Yeah, because for you know, like I said earlier, for the last twenty plus years been some plan city town. I've been voting the city. You know, they took my money, they took my vote. So, you know, that's what I have on that. When, when was your annexation? Man, I don't know. I've worked for a bit. <laughs> well, then I, out there. I had the same answer. answer. Exactly. And Wade Francis and I was on the council when all that pocket law come in. All, all that out in there is, is supposed to be in. Yeah, and if there was intent to, to annex I don't know. It was and, right. and, and, got to thinking about it. I don't know if it was at the time that our city clerk at that time became ill and we had to change. She passed away and I don't know if it didn't get, but everybody out there across the river out there was tuck, was, was tuck in. And if last week on or week before last on your map it wasn't colored in. but. Right. Uh, but I have, I've had people call me and tell me they haven't been paid tax. There's a cluster of parcels up here in that area that are not connected to any other part of city limits but in the tax assessors there. They're not contiguous to the city limits. And that's one of the requirements of annexation is that it be annexed so that it's contiguous to the city well, limits. That's, that's so we just need to see what the, what the ordinance itself intended to do and, and see what was supposed to be brought in at that time. Yeah, I could give you a year on that. And, and we'll go back and see what we find in the probate council. For the sake of clarity, I may have misunderstood something. Did you say that at some point in time in some of the mountains that somebody just took a pencil and draw some down? In every community across the United States. Okay. I think the gentleman in the back corner was... Uh, I talked to the developer, Mr. Lockett, he told me they deeded Candlelight Lane to the city, and about less than a month ago, the city came out there and tarred and slagged that road. But according to that, was, we're not even close. So I think it's just a case of like Tim said, I think it's just a case of a miscommunication somewhere. I'm sure it is. I'm yeah, sure that's, that's the city that's that's the road you're talking about. Yeah, city street. Um, sure, if, if the council had an intent to take in the property, which there's some people who are on council here tonight that were on council at that time are saying that they did intend to take it in, um, there's going to be some record of it. And if we can find that record, then it shouldn't be terribly controversial to show those parcels that, were, that are recorded that have some record of an intent to annex, showing them as inside the city limits. Sorry to cut you off, Brent. Go ahead. I've, I've got that somewhere. Uh, go ahead. Okay. I'll find it. Well, you said, if I read it correctly, in the paper sometime back, that you thought it was maybe a mistake with not having some uh, some of the property zoned as farming, and yet I don't see anything zoned specifically farming. What's yes. the purpose? Of that? The, the R1 district is. No, so it includes includes at this point. It includes. It is not zoned specifically for. It permits agricultural in that area, and it is it is described as an agricultural rural ag agricultural district with the intent of of encouraging rural agriculture and single family dwellings. So it's not specifically reserved for agriculture, but it permits agriculture as well as other development types. Anybody else? Well, if there are those that have questions, if you're comfortable coming up and asking them, or you want to get back with us, um, the next planning commission meeting is going to be fourth Monday? Is that correct? <clears throat> Last Monday in this month. Last Monday in this month. Pardon me for a second. That's the 30th. 
Yeah, we, cha we changed that when you had a request. That's correct. I, I forgot about that. So the next planning commission meeting will be on the 30th, and I'm sure there will be plenty of conversation about this in between and leading up to that. So I'm, I'm sure that the mayor will be happy to hear your concerns. I don't want to volunteer anyone else. I, of course, will, will be listening intently to what the city folks here, the officials here say. Um, as I said before, I'll be glad to take your questions. It might take you a while to get to me if there's a lot of folks that, that have some questions that want me to address. And I may not be able to answer it this evening, but I'll see as much as I can. I'll see what I can get for you as far as a response. Is both those maps the same? Yes, all three of them. The one outside as well as the two up front are all the same. What is the... Remember, I didn't grow up here. I, I still sometimes get confused by that, but that northeast area, is there a general <coughs> communities that are sort of being left out, uh, names for those communities that people would know? I tend to be looking like that. <laughs> That's part of the Sugar Bend area. The Sugar Bend area is pretty much sort of being left out. Okay. No. It's it, well, it, yeah, being left out on the map, but it should be in the city. No, I think I said no. Oh. Part of it is along the road, you're right, but part of it is not on the northeast part. Part, is not in. part of the Sugar Bend. So part of the Sugar Bend is being left out. Okay. Oh, you. Let me just say one thing here as we close, and afterwards we can come talk to Nathan and look at the map. Um, we know this is not perfect, but we're trying. That's why we've taken our time for two months to try to uh, get a little bit better than what it was. And uh, we purposely did that. We purposely tried to get your input, and um, I think it's going to be a lot better. I, I know the ordinance is. I've looked at the ordinance, and as we work to get this map correct, I think it would be something we can live with. But uh, like I say, individually, we come see Nathan, this is over, and we'll we'll start doing some digging and find out specific questions. Uh, we can't vote on anything tonight anyway, but uh, specifically, if you have a question, we'll take it down and do the research and see if we can get it right. And uh, once again, thank you all for coming. Right, right also, Sir. You, you know, you spoke to me last, last meeting. We're not going to be in no big hurry to get this done. Right. We're going to make sure, try to get it as close to right as we can if it takes a while. Right. So, you know, we're, we're not going to do nothing in the next two weeks. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we're trying to take off. <laughs> 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 <laughs>